don't make these potentially deadly mistakes while scuba diving. Look, scuba diving can be considered a fun and relaxing sport, but it is still considered an extreme sport. Unfortunately, around 90% of dive accidents are caused by human error. So in this video, I'll go over seven of the most common mistakes beginners are making that could be potentially fatal. And often, they don't even realize they're making them. Let's get into it. I'm Thomas Hughes, a professional scuba instructor, and on this channel, you'll see videos on scuba education, equipment, experiences, and environmental awareness. These mistakes aren't ranked in any type of specific order, but they are all completely avoidable. Make sure you stick around to the end so you can learn how to avoid all of these and make yourself a much safer diver for both you and your dive buddies around you. Number one, ignoring your pre-dive safety planning and safety checks. One of the first things you learn as an open water student is that you need to have your pre-dive safety checks in mind. In PADI, we use a system called BRAF or BWRAF. Often we use acronyms like like because we really aren't fish to remember this acronym. And it has to do with the checks that we do with our dive buddies themselves to make sure we have everything set up properly before we go into the water. B stands for BCD or buoyancy and is basically making sure that your BCD is on properly, it's holding air, you can inflate and deflate properly. And I also like to include checking any of the restraints and the weight pockets and things like that in this, which kind of go into the other steps. W stands for weights. And this is to make sure that you are properly weighted, you're weight pockets are in and sturdy, or if you're wearing a weight belt that you have that weight belt attached properly to. R stands for releases. And like I mentioned, when I'm checking out the BCD, I'm also checking all the releases. So this is gonna be the clips for your shoulder straps, for example, the buckle for your waist strap, or maybe the buckle on your uh, BCD waist itself, the cummerbund, or maybe you have a crotch strap as well. These releases can actually change a little bit from BCD to BCD. And sometimes it's just a simple clip. Sometimes there's some type of push button system or something like that. That. A stands for air, and this is where you want to make sure that your tank is fully opened. Making sure that your buddy's air is on all the way is part of it, but then also checking the SPG and making sure that they have the right air pressure. I've unfortunately seen where a diver has grabbed a tank from a rack thinking it was full, not checking their gauge, and they wound up being low on air and actually ran out of air on a dive. Doing a pre-dive safety check is gonna help prevent this. F stands for final checks, and this is where we wanna make sure we have our masks, we have our fins, we have our weights, our snorkel, everything we need for the dive. If we're taking our camera down with us, if we're doing anything like that. And the last thing I'll say about this is to plan your dive, dive your plan. It's a phrase that you've probably heard many times, and while technical divers and cave divers are often known for doing really in-depth plans, even recreational divers really need to plan their dives out better. Often we get complacent, we just start forgetting these things, and we just say, oh, you know, sure, we'll dive to about 60 feet or so and don't really have any type of plan there but whether that's using rule of thirds or a specific time that you're going to turn back or a specific location you need to always monitor your gas pressure monitor uh, what your dive plan was and, and how deep you are how long you're going things like that so you can make sure that you get back to your exit point properly or just in general just know what you're diving against of course things change underwater sometimes sometimes there's emergencies but knowing what your plan is ahead of time is going to let everyone be on the same page to have a safer dive experience overall. The second potentially fatal thing that divers do, especially beginner divers, is going to be rapid ascents and just poor buoyancy control overall. A rapid ascent or uncontrolled ascent is sometimes caused by people not dumping the air out of their BCD properly as they start to ascend. And before they know it, they're going faster and faster to the surface. And then just like a rocket, they end up at the surface from 30 feet or 40 feet before they even realize it. And maybe they just spent an hour at 60 feet or 45 minutes at 60 feet. And, you know, unfortunately, they put themselves at the risk of having the bends. So when we ascend, we want to ascend slowly and conservatively. Uh, 30 feet per minute is a really conservative measurement that I've heard some people say. In the PADI system, we say no faster than 60 feet per minute. Going up too quickly too fast can cause the bends or decompression sickness. And this is because of the nitrogen load that our body's been taking on. And ascending too fast basically starts to remove the pressure quickly, which allows that nitrogen to expand and start to form bubbles in our bloodstream. Those issues like that can actually cause you to have to go to a recompression chamber or can actually be fatal as well. The other thing that can happen in those rapid ascents is sometimes people will hold their breath. And I'll talk a little bit more about fundamentals later and the issues that can come with that. The other thing in this category is gonna be just your buoyancy in general. So whether that's ascending too fast or maybe descending too fast. And if you go crashing to the bottom because you're not weighted properly, you might not be able to equalize properly and often enough. I actually have a video in the cards about equalization that I'll link up there. 
You also could be falling straight to the bottom and damage marine life. You might land on a coral reef and get scratched or cut up. You might land on something spiny or pokey and, and actually get cut or even have venom injected into you as well. You could get a bite or a sting because you fall right on top of some type of marine life out there. So when we descend, we want to have controlled descents, just like we have controlled ascents. And you could do this by using a descent line or a mooring line or something like that. Uh, if it's a buoy in freshwater over a training platform, you could use that line to kind of slow yourself down. Now, I did mention proper weighting, so being overweighted can cause major issues for you as well. Also being underweighted. If you're near the end of a dive, your aluminum 80 starts to get floaty, and if you aren't weighted properly, you aren't gonna be able to stay down at your safety stop very easily. So you might have trouble where you start ending up getting up to the surface because you just don't have enough lead to stay down. Now, if you're overweighted, this is where you might sink down to the bottom too quickly. If you're really overweighted, you might not have enough lift in your wing to bring you up properly. And having that overweighted problem can cause you to fall way too quickly or way further than you meant to. And, you know, unfortunately divers have been lost and have been killed because they've been in say blue hole or something like that. They were overweighted and they got too deep and then weren't able to inflate and react fast enough to be able to uh, overcome that and be able to swim up to the surface and be able to ascend to a safer depth. Uh, they start using air faster as they go deeper. Maybe they didn't do an emergency weight drop or drop their weight belt type thing because they just started panicking. And unfortunately, again, they breathe through their air too quickly. Uh, being overweighted cause overexertion, which can cause you to breathe quickly and again, go through your air cylinder faster than you meant to. And just recently, I won't get too in depth with this, but you can look up the story, but there was actually a diver in a dry suit who was way, way, way overweighted. Um, I won't again get into the specifics of it because there was a, a case about this that was settled outside of court, but basically the diver wound up dying because they were way too overweighted. They were in a dry suit. And then also going back to the first point that I mentioned, they did not do a pre-dive safety check properly because their dry suit inflator hose was not connected, which meant they couldn't expand the gas within their dry suit. So they got a dry suit squeeze plus the overweightedness. They wound up sinking to the bottom and unfortunately they drowned. So just again, proper weighting, proper safety checks. These are all important to prevent fatal accidents like this from happening. Number three is going to be diving beyond your limits and without the proper training. Look, I'll start this by saying that there's no scuba police out there. And unfortunately, if you just go out diving by yourselves without a specific operation to make sure you're not doing something dumb, you might find yourself going into a cave or a cavern without having proper training. Or maybe you enter a wreck and decide to penetrate it without, again, the proper training. You also might decide to dive a lot deeper than you should without the proper training. And really, these are just major issues that are asking for an accident to occur or potentially, again, a fatal incident. I'll start with talking about diving deep and some of the issues there. So there's this whole concept of oxygen toxicity. So if you didn't know, oxygen becomes toxic to us and can actually cause major, major lung and brain issues as well as death, depending on how deep we are. The deeper we are, the higher the atmospheric pressure. This causes our PPO2 or partial pressure of oxygen to increase. And that high oxygen percentage at depth can then cause you to die. So every tank fill that we have, the percentage of oxygen we have something called a max operating depth, which tells us how deep we can go basically without having the oxygen toxicity. And if you don't have the proper training to know what your uh, nitrox blend is or have deep diver training to know how to handle and respond to narcosis and things like that, you might find yourself going deeper than you planned. You might, again, like I mentioned earlier, be overweighted or not have enough lift in your, in your BCD if you go too, too deep. And most importantly, you're gonna be blowing through your air and maybe have to do decompression stops that you didn't realize because you just don't know what you're doing with your no decompression limits as a recreational diver because you are way deeper than you're supposed to be. You never received the training and now you're gonna have a major issue that again will likely turn out to be fatal if you aren't handling it properly. The other major issue that you'll find is overhead environment. So this is gonna include things like wrecks, caves, caverns, and and basically any area that you cannot surface by going directly to the surface, you have to actually find your way out first and then surface. There's a reason why there is specialty training for this. And often it's considered technical diving, depending on the wreck, cave, cavern that you're going through, where you really need a lot of very specific training and certification and practice to go into these areas. Often outside of caves, and almost every case I've seen, if it's a cave that's been explored before, there's gonna be some type of warning sign that will literally tell you that you will die by entering this cave if you don't have proper training. There are so many potential issues that can happen by entering an overhead environment like this. Again, whether it's a wreck, 
a cavern, or a cave, even if you just go a little bit into it, you really have so many potential issues. This isn't a training video to teach you how to do this, but things like laying lines properly, knowing how to uh, navigate in a complete silt out where you have no visibility, and just things like proper buoyancy control, going back to a previous step that I mentioned, is gonna be so important because you can have entanglements, you can have silt outs where you have no visibility, you need to have proper lights so you know what you're doing there, proper buddy control as well, being able to navigate just off of touch and just so many other issues to where you need to be able to exit those caves or overhead environments properly so you can actually surface in the case of an emergency. Finally, some other things just talking about going beyond your limits and not necessarily specific training aspects is things like going into a strong current or a strong drift and basically trying to fight that current or drift a little bit too much and not recognizing that maybe it's just time to end the dive and these aren't good diving conditions. Swimming into a current is gonna cause you to overexert and breathe a lot heavier than you would normally, which is gonna cause you to go through your air much, much faster than you would have normally. Again, if you're focused so hard on going into that current, you might not even notice your SPG saying to yourself like, hey, this is way lower than I should have been. I'm into my reserve pressure now and I really need to exit, but instead you're just trying to fight that current. The other things to think about is things like uh, low or no visibility. If you aren't properly trained, you may have trouble in those areas. And honestly, just diving in a lake or a quarry like I do all the time, we sometimes have visibility that, I mean, is maybe one or two feet because it's just silt outs where that water is stirred up due to maybe new open water diver students that are out there training or just, you know, unfortunately someone again with poor buoyancy that hit the bottom and kicked up a bunch of silt. And now that silt's floating in the water and I can barely see my hand in front of my face. And the last thing I'll note on going out beyond your limits is recognizing when you do not have the proper exposure protection. This could either be too much exposure protection, so maybe you're in a seven mil neoprene dry suit, for example, and you're just burning up and way, way, way too hot and way too uncomfortable, or it could be the opposite where you're not wearing enough exposure protection and you are freezing cold. Of course, if you're cold, the first thing to think about is you can literally get hypothermia by just being submerged in the water and being too cold like that. But more importantly, you might start making really dumb decisions because you are too cold to think clearly and you just aren't thinking properly. And unfortunately, that causes people to make poor choices underwater and poor choices can lead to fatalities. Before I move on to the other ones, if you're finding this valuable, please consider subscribing. It really helps me out and lets me know you like more content like this. And most importantly, you can watch some of my educational content to prevent making mistakes like this. Number four is gonna be ignoring your equipment. Look, our dive gear is expensive and it requires proper maintenance and cleaning before and after dives and even on annual basis as well. Like any other piece of mechanical equipment or electronic equipment, the stuff breaks down and wears down over time, whether it's a wetsuit that has holes in it, a strap that breaks, it has maybe tears in it that causes leaks in the mask skirt, for example, on your mask, maybe the uh, buckle for your, your strap on your fin breaks or is failing on you as well. Having the proper maintenance and understanding your gear and keeping it clean and, and maintained properly is gonna be key. And unfortunately, a lot of beginners just don't service their equipment properly. If you think about it, depending on what the piece of equipment is, it could be a gauge, for example, that's actually giving you the wrong readings or a compass that's giving you the wrong heading. And that might actually be more dangerous than a complete failure. If my compass just isn't working at all, then I know, hey, I can't trust this compass anymore. But if it's off and it's giving me the wrong headings, I might end up in the completely wrong area. Or my SPG could be looking like it actually has plenty of gas, but I don't notice that every time I breathe in, that needle just falls and comes back up again. And what that could mean is that the SPG itself, the analog piece inside of it has failed. And unfortunately, I can't trust my SPG to tell me how much gas I have left. This goes a little bit into planning your dive and diving your plan properly, but your dive computer or dive tables, if you're using those, will tell you things like your max depth and your NDL or no decompression limits for recreational dives. So ignoring your equipment and not reading your NDL or keeping track of your timer, if you have a watch or a computer that has a timer on, on it and counts basically how long you've been underwater, what your NDL is remaining, is another major issue where people are again, ignoring their equipment, ignoring their gauges, not paying attention to how deep they are, they're going way deeper than they should, they aren't realizing how much air they're burning through or how long they've been underwater, and before you know it, they have to do a mandatory deco stop or something like that, which can put them at risk of running out of air or just, you know, again, blowing that deco stop, and now they have the bends or uh, basically decompression sickness because they didn't do those stops to allow themselves to off-gas properly. Check out the card and the description down below for a video all about cleaning and maintaining your equipment properly so you know how to do pre-dive and post-dive inspections and maintenance to keep things clean, working properly, and well-serviced as well. Number five for mistakes that a lot of beginners make without even really realizing it necessarily is neglecting their health and fitness. 
If you're congested or have a cold, you may not be able to equalize your ears properly. So you might actually have a blockage in your station tubes and you'll pinch your nose and blow to do that Valsalva technique. And unfortunately, your ears aren't gonna clear. If you can't equalize properly, you can actually risk having barotrauma, which is basically damage to the ears and the station tube. It could be something like a ruptured eardrum or the uh, middle ear, the, the window. I forget the specific term for the ear itself, but the small window, I believe it's called in there, is gonna be ruptured and basically other issues like that from basically not clearing properly and the atmospheric pressure becomes too much on your ears. And again, ruptures an eardrum causes major damage or even permanent damage to your ears. Uh, that can also cause you to have vertigo and that vertigo can cause confusion, dizziness. And if your buddy's not paying attention and seeing you kind of spinning underwater there, Again, this could be a fatal incident. You might think to yourself, oh, I'll just take some type of nasal decongestant like a Sudafed or something like that. But unfortunately, if that wears off while you're diving at depth, yes, you were able to clear on the way down, but now it's wearing off and that congestion's coming back and now you can't clear your ears properly as you ascend. So that gas, that middle ear that has a little bit of airspace in there is now trying to expand but it has nowhere to go because your ears are blocked due to that nasal decongestant wearing off. And now again, you're risking barotrauma where you could rupture your eardrums, rupture that middle ear uh, small window. And you know, unfortunately cause again, vertigo, major issues, all the same things I just talked about on the ascent instead. So nasal decongestants just to get past it and just you know fight through the dive. This is something that again can cause major, major issues. It could be fatal. And just if you aren't feeling well, don't go diving on the physical fitness side of things, we need to remember that scuba diving really can be demanding to our bodies. We have heavy tanks we need to load onto the boat or carry on our backs into the shore. We have all of our gear and equipment and things like that too. And you know, while actual diving itself usually isn't too much exertion, all of that gear out of the water is really heavy. And usually we can't wait to get in the water to get that weight off of our back or off of our sides, etc. Unfortunately, there's a number of reports of people that have had either heart attacks, even at the surface at the end of a dive because they were lifting their camera out of the water or taking their gear off in the water to lift it up. And they just wind up having a heart attack because they were just so overexerted at that point. That extra exertion can cause issues as well. And you should really be in the best physical shape you can be at all times, of course, for our health, but especially while doing a sport and an extreme sport like scuba diving. Now at number six, I have complacency and forgetting your fundamentals, which kind of encompass almost all of these things in general, but I think it's important to call these out specifically. One of the most common things that I've seen happen on dive trips, especially, or just out at the local lake with divers going in and out of the water is I hardly ever see them check their air supply on their SPG or on their computer. And they just never really check how much gas they have remaining, whether this is during a pre-dive safety check and they just ignore it completely. And again, maybe they grabbed a spent tank or they forgot to change their tanks between dives, or maybe they have a leak they don't know about, or just in general, they're, they're deeper than they thought and they start breathing through that air and they just aren't checking their tank pressure for some reason. That complacency of not checking your gear and checking your gas properly and often is something that I see again happen a little bit too often with divers who are just comfortable and they say, ah, oh, you know, 3000 PSI or 200 bar, I know I can die for an hour, no problem. Another thing you'll see divers do sometimes is they get low on air and they're at like maybe, let's say it's supposed to be a 60 minute dive and they're at 50 minutes and they say, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm low on air, but I'm just gonna tell them I'm good. I'm gonna say I have a thousand PSI left still and we're totally fine because I don't wanna make you know anyone else end their dive early or I feel bad about ending their dive early because I breathe gas faster than my buddy does. This is not fair, okay? Uh, smaller frame people, often women as well, they, they breathe gas a lot more efficiently than men do and, and just bigger people. I'm, I'm a bigger framed male myself and I breathe gas a lot faster than other people. Yes, I've got a couple hundred dives now, I'm an instructor and I, I breathe a lot slower, I guess, or a lot less gas than maybe a new diver would, but don't feel bad about this. Like everyone understands if you're running low on gas, you're running low on gas. We can change the dive profile. It's no problem, but don't hold that information to yourself and feel bad about ending the dive because you know, you have a problem with your ears, but instead of telling someone about that, you risk barotrauma instead, or you're low on gas, but instead of telling someone, you just say, oh, I'll just push through it and I can make it 10 more minutes, no problem. You cannot do that, okay? You are putting yourself at risk and your buddy at risk and the DM leading the guide, if it's a guided dive tour or something like that, everyone's being at risk. It's probably gonna ruin the rest of the dive day due to your accident or incident. And unfortunately, again, this can be a fatal thing that can happen. Speaking about fundamentals as well, we wanna make sure we always do our three minute safety stop. Yes, in recreational no decompression limit diving, we technically can blow our safety stop and we should in theory be okay. But it's important to remember that one, 
that's just theoretical, okay? I've seen people completely dive within their limits and still get bent or get the bends or DCS, decompression sickness, whatever you want to say. Um, you know, you check their computer, you check their dive profile. They did everything right and they still got bent. So having a three minute safety stop just allows you to be even more conservative and safe as a diver and give your body time to off gas that extra nitrogen. You know, especially if you've been repeated, repeatedly diving two or three times a day throughout the whole week on a dive trip, for example, give yourself that time to off gas. There's no reason to not do a safety stop unless you're running low on gas and you just, you can't complete a safety stop, I guess. But that kind of goes to the earlier fundamentals. You shouldn't be in that situation. This is why we're safe, conservative divers. We have backups of everything. We, you know, do the rule of thirds. We, we do all these things to help prevent these issues from happening. So don't forget your fundamentals or blow them off due to complacency. With this, you should always remember to dive with a buddy and then you need to be within close proximity of that buddy too. You don't want to be super far away. I shouldn't be on one end of a reef and I look 30 feet over and that's where my dive buddy's at. No, if I'm out of air, I'm not gonna swim 30 feet to go get them. If I'm 30 feet down, I'm probably gonna do a CESA and have to do an emergency ascent instead. I wanna make sure that my buddy is close enough to me that I can get to them and they can get to me if there's any type of emergency. To that effect, I would recommend everyone eventually get rescue certified. And if you wanna do a self-reliance course, go for it. But that's really more of a self-reliance in the case of an emergency than giving you permission to dive by yourself. Number seven is not properly getting certified and trained for the type of diving you're gonna be doing. So I know I touched on this earlier with diving beyond your limits or beyond your specific certifications, but what I'm referring to now is specifically calling out the people that think that they can just go in the water and scuba dive because they have a cylinder, they have an air compressor at home, and they picked up a regulator off of Facebook Marketplace or something like that and just said, oh sure, you know, I'll just go in the water and start scuba diving without getting certified. Look, scuba diving really is an amazing experience and I don't want this video of fatal mistakes to deter anyone at all from going out and getting certified or going out and getting diving, but the important thing here is that you do actually get certified. I said it at the start of the video, but 90% of dive incidents are actually caused by human error and Really, we can fix this by just not being complacent and getting proper training and certification. Even as an instructor, I'm still always learning and getting additional training. Even if it's a class I've taken before, I might retake it at some point just to see what a different instructor has to say about it and what I can learn and gather from the course. I never want to get complacent because I always want to drill the skills. I want to practice backfinning. I want to practice helicopter turns. I want to practice this or that. And there's just always something new to learn and some new skill to develop. So if you came to this video and you're interested in scuba diving, but were worried about some of the fatal issues or just how dangerous it might be, make sure you seek out a local dive center where you can actually go ahead and reach out to that dive shop, talk to them about trying out scuba diving and figure out if it's going to be for you. I actually made a video all about how you can try scuba diving in a safe and supervised way. So click or tap the screen now to check that out. With that, stay safe, have fun, and let's go diving.